Over the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about wireless, extraterrestrial, renewable energy, and tell you why it's made me think differently about microwaves, solar panels, and billionaires. And if you're thinking this all sounds rather like science fiction, that's because it literally came from science fiction and was dreamt up by Isaac Asimov in 1941 for a novel called Reason. And it turned out not to be a totally ludicrous idea. And so NASA genuinely looked into it following the oil crisis in 1976. Because we are now running out of gas and oil, we must prepare quickly for a third change to strict conservation and to permanent renewable energy sources like solar power. And as they say, good ideas are hard to die. And so it's back and genuinely being considered as part of the road to net zero. But what on earth or in space are we talking about? If you want to see everything electric in real life, then join us at one of our fully charged live shows around the world. Next up, we're in Amsterdam for Fully Charged Live Europe on the 24th, 25th and 26th of November. Space-based solar power, or SBSP, where solar panels are put into high Earth orbit and wirelessly beam energy down to a fixed point on Earth where it's fed into the electricity grid. And, spoiler alert, it's been shown to be both technically and economically feasible. Today, a team from Caltech has been busy working on it, the European Space Agency has a program called Solaris, there's a US military drone covered in solar panels in orbit as we speak, and China, Japan and South Korea all have projects too. But why is anyone bothering in the first place? The answer is, of course, all about that baseload. Baseload is the minimum demand on the power grid that's mainly met by coal, nuclear or gas, i.e. sources that are unsuited to varying their output to match demand changes within a day. And given that electrification of heating and mobility will increase overall electricity demand, the issue of baseload tends to get some knickers in a twist, given the unpredictable and intermittent nature of wind and solar and, frankly, the slow rate of deployment of grid scale and home energy storage. Hence nuclear, carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, even fusion enter the energy mix debate. And now, space-based solar power. And that's because SBSP can capture solar energy 99% of the time, making it an ideal candidate for baseload. Compare that to here on Earth in the UK, where solar panels capture sunlight just 20 to 30% of the time. But if solar panels are located 36,000 kilometers above the Earth, they don't have to contend with night and day, clouds, or atmosphere to absorb solar radiation. So the promise of meeting baseload's needs is deeply attractive, and even more so given the cost is estimated to be roughly $50 per megawatt hour, almost half of that of nuclear and carbon capture and storage. That does include a lot of assumptions, which is where the billionaires come in, but more on Musk later. Well, it's certainly not without its challenges, but to get into them, I need to tell you how it works. Now, SBSP operates on the principle of putting a load of solar panels at geostationary Earth orbit, i.e. 36,000 kilometers above the Earth, where satellites don't move relative to the Earth. Solar panels absorb solar radiation, generating DC electrical current, and then convert it to microwaves. Yes, microwaves, literally like those in your microwave, or more accurately, like those that communication satellites use. Side note, I know what you're thinking. Are we going to cook the Earth? Well, I will come to that in a second. And actually, this isn't as abstract as it sounds. Using and moving energy is really just a case of transforming it from one form to another, and in order to make it commercially worthwhile, ideally doing that in a super efficient way. Hydropower, for example, is a product of turning potential energy into kinetic energy into electrical energy. With SBSP, electrical current is being turned into microwaves, a form of electromagnetic radiation. Radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, UV, X-rays and gamma rays are all part of the electromagnetic spectrum and contain energy, which is proportional to their frequency. The higher the frequency, the higher the energy. The solar radiation that reaches the Earth is made up of infrared, visible wavelengths and some UV, but high frequency short wavelengths are easily absorbed by the atmosphere, which is why the sun's energy at the equator is only about a quarter of what it is in space. Microwaves sit in a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum and have longer wavelengths, a few centimetres long, and lower frequency, giving them the benefit of being able to travel much further without being absorbed at all. They're completely weather independent. But electromagnetic waves left to their own devices will spread out in all directions. However, when you combine waves in the right phase, you can steer and direct them and modulate the power and intensity of that beam. In fact, there's a company called Guru who are using this principle on a tiny, tiny scale so that you can 
Do things like charge your phone from anywhere it is in the room. But even with great phasing, waves will diffuse and spread out, and so there's a careful balance of either optimizing for a super narrow beam or maximizing power. But you can imagine that over 36,000 kilometers back to Earth, you need a great big whopping target in order to scoop up those microwaves. SBSB uses an almighty net of rectifying antennas or rectennas to collect the microwaves, which are then converted back into electrical power to put into the grid. So nothing too wild there, but ration your apathy as the numbers are wild. Based on the Casapia SBSP design, for two gigawatts, i.e. two nuclear plants worth of energy, we're talking a structure almost 2,000 tonnes and diameters of two kilometres. It needs a transmitter roughly one kilometre across, and for context, the International Space Station is a comparably tiny 109 metres long. Here on Earth, it would require an elliptical collector 6.7 kilometres by 13 kilometres, and whilst there aren't an abundance of areas that size, filling that same area with land solar panels would generate about a third as much power. And interestingly, there's some suggestion to co-locate those rectenna fields with offshore wind farms where there's already a grid connection. But the big juicy question, if we're talking microwaves, does that mean that the areas of rectennas get super hot? No, or not really. The intensity of the beam at the center is limited to 240 watts per meter squared, a quarter of the sun's intensity at the equator, and therefore considered safe for humans. The SPS Alpha and Casapia designs have formed the basis of a lot of feasibility studies, and the European Space Agency is currently exploring two further architectures which will be released later this year. Some are looking at beaming lasers from lower orbit, but you need loads of them, and owing to the lower orbit, they're not immune to the effects of clouds or day and night cycles, so we'll focus on higher geostationary orbit SPSP for now. So we've got some obvious challenges. The scale of these things cannot be understated. And it's not so much that there's not any room. I mean, it's literally called space, but nothing that big has ever been built up there. That needs exceptionally sophisticated modular design that can be built autonomously by robots. And when it comes to pricing things in space, the cost of launches is everything, and specifically the dollars per kilo. Clearly, we need mega efficient solar panels that are great at absorbing a big broad range of frequencies and are extremely, extremely, extremely lightweight. But I promise billionaires. And this is where Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk's foray into space may be really helpful. Three, two, one. Lift off of the Falcon 9. Partially reusable space launches such as those demonstrated by SpaceX have substantially reduced the cost per kilo of space missions. And should SpaceX reach its targets with the Falcon, the launch cost of Casapia could be $5 billion per gigawatt, 46 times less than NASA's modeling for SPSP in 1979. What's more, should SpaceX reach its target of 100 reuses, that would further reduce the cost by a factor of 10, and that's before we consider likely improvements in solar cells and other electronics. And this is what I find totally remarkable about SBSP. The technologies are not new. The principles are exactly the same as communication satellites. Only this time, as we're interested in collecting power and not the digital signal, we need it to work on a much, much, much grander scale. But the costs are kind of easy to project because it's based on technology that largely exists rather than requiring loads of major scientific breakthroughs and invention, as you do with, say, fusion. But the question still remains, should we do it? I said that baseload was the principal reason for pursuing spacey solar, but there are some other thoughts. If SBSB is pulled off, it marks a moment in history. And I'm not being hyperbolic. It gives energy its Wi-Fi moment where moving it isn't limited by physical cables and the headache that comes with a geographical mismatch between where energy is created versus where it needs to be used. You could direct that beam of microwaves to deliver power anywhere it's needed, such as to other countries or for disaster relief. But does that prompt a moral debate? Space doesn't exactly belong to anyone. Geostationary Earth orbit is governed by the UN and specifically the International Telecommunications Union. It's not sovereign territory. So if a country or enterprise launches SBSP and capitalizes on this infinite, abundant resource from a place that isn't exactly claimable, what rules are they governed by? Is there some treaty to establish infrastructure and mechanisms that everyone can benefit from? It could become such a centralized source of power, figuratively and electrically, that it needs some major thought as to how that's used for the good of the planet and not something to weaponize or use to exert control over countries' access to power. 
If I was Prime Minister for a day, I'd call a committee meeting to kick off the ethical questions regarding SBSP and meanwhile get my best analysts modelling the relative merits of meeting baseload via distributed energy using virtual power plants, V2G and home batteries. But I'm not Prime Minister. So where are we and will it ever come off? Well, stranger things have happened and if there's a political and financial will to do so, it certainly feels possible. Here in the UK, we could have 15% of our power from SBSP by 2042. And whilst there are so many caveats to making that reality, even just pursuing it will push exceptional developments in next generation solar panels that all of us Earth dwellers can benefit from. So who knows? Regardless, it is a marvel that we're living in an age where it's not being dismissed as nonsense. And that is kind of remarkable. So let's carry on the debate in the comments and do take a look at this episode on carbon capture or this one on solar for everyone. And a massive thanks to Sanjay Vidrandan, who leads the Solaris Initiative at the European Space Agency, for all his advice when researching this episode.